Hello, dear friends. This is Kardec Radio at 11 p.m. Nourishing our souls with uh, Lifting Hope. Lifting Hope is a program based on the book Memoirs of Suicide. We here have therapeutic conversations with you regarding the chapters of this book. This book was written through the mediumship of Yvonne Pereira, a Brazilian medium who was born in 1900 and lived a very um, difficult life, though very honorable. She was born in a spiritist house and she became a spiritist and a renowned spiritist who really made a difference. And she made a difference mostly through this book and other books, but dedicating her life to helping suicidal spirits and people who were thinking of suicide. This book is all about hope. Many people are afraid to read it because they think it's all about anguishes and pain. Actually, this book, as you have seen this far, it's all about the mercy of God, how we are treated with loving kindness by the loving spirits that are guided by Jesus Christ. And Mother Mary was assigned by Jesus to take care of those who were the most unfortunate on earth, the suicide spirits. So welcome to Kardec Radio. Yes, Camilo Botelho is the spirit author of this book. Do Leon Denis also revised the book and made the book ever more special for us. Okay, so welcome, welcome, dear souls. Welcome here to Kardec Radio, where we're going to nourish our souls with lifting hope. I can see friends joining us. Sunshine, hello, sunshine. Hello, Daisy. How have you been, Daisy? Hello, hello Jailton. Big hug to you, Jailton. Hello, John the Rosa. Hope you're feeling better. And hello, Ricardo Pifano. It's good to see you. Alan Swift, how have you been? Adilson, a super hug to you, Adilson. So, so, a super hug to you too. I see more friends coming in, but I cannot distinguish everybody. But as you know the Brazil, hello, friend, and others come along, we'll be able to say hi and join you. Don't forget, we're doing this because it's really a classroom. All of us now are in a classroom together, learning from these illuminated minds, teachings that will carry to immortality. If you ask yourself, oh, am I wasting my time watching this? I'll say this, if there is one thing you never waste your time with, is the teachings of spiritism because they are universal truths that serve a purpose everywhere we go in this universe on earth in mars within the solar system outside the solar system because it's we're talking about the divine laws we're never going to go wrong right weber costa welcome to kardec radio Thank you, Jailton. Hello, Joyce Magalhães. A super hug to you and the adorable children and to our friend Marco. Thank you for joining us. Ready? Today, we are in a happy moment of this book. You remember when we stopped studying this book? Let me go back here. This is part three. We are reading the last third of this book. Believe it or not, it's been 21 days, today 22 days. And we have been studying these chapters. And this chapter today is about the university sector. It's very special. And remember, we're not talking about university in the highest spheres of our planet. We're talking about university level in these regions near 
the Earth's crust and the value of suicides, of course, out of it, close to it, close to the hospital. It's a whole colony, many buildings. There is even the hospital, and now they enter a new phase. Camilo, Bellarmino, João de Azevedo, and others, they decided not to reincarnate yet. They were given the opportunity to choose. Do you want to reincarnate right now, or do you want to deepen your knowledge and be initiated in the sciences of the spirit? And they said, we do. We want to do it. So they were moved to this new area, and now they are there. Beautiful enough, actually, this is chapter 16. I will correct it. And this chapter 16 is titled, A Place of Hope. See, this book is all about hope from beginning to end. Beginning because though the sufferings are happening, we get to know they are not abandoned. That the good spirits have a map of the value of suicides. They know precisely who is there. They know precisely how long they are suffering. And when they stop a certain moment of a certain phase, they already know when they are able to come and rescue them. So it's about hope, 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 hope. Hope, hope. Camilo begins this chapter by saying, we spent our first night in anxious expectation. And now they describe again nature. Our rooms faced the garden and from their windows, we could see the vast horizon of the metropolis inlaid with graceful pavilions that seem to be built of mother of pearl and charmingly adorned with pergolas that release the delicate fragrances from a myriad of exuberant shrubs and flowers. Things were no longer as insipidly white as they had been in the hospital sector. You see, it matters if we expose ourselves to nature, flowers, plants. In the spiritual realm, which is the real world, because ours is just temporary, and a rough image of what it is there, we need to to strive to achieve this harmony in the forms, in the shapes, in the organization of everything. To be simple, it's not about being careless. To be simple and harmonious. Harmony, he's talking about harmony. The landscape around providing a sense of harmony, an invitation to harmony, okay? Let us mark it down because this is an important observation. Camilo is not sparing words. This book was re revised by our dear Leon Denis, who was very wise in his life as a dedicated spiritist and he's still dedicated to it. He knows it all. He coordinated the effort to bring this book to life. And when it comes, we understand it's not by chance. They are not flourishing the words here for us. They are teaching us. So let us revisit our homes and see how else we can improve the harmonious environment of our homes, shall we? It's important that it's simple, but harmoniously simple, okay? Hello, Andrea Cosley. Welcome to Kardec Radio. So, everything indicated that according to our affinities, we had gravitated to a university sector where new cycles of study and learning would be open to us according to our desires. 
They were walking around, observing the buildings and the architecture of the buildings. Broad avenues stretched through majestic wooded areas and alongside gently undulating lakes edged with fragrant flowering bushes. And all in a line like an unforgettable vision of a fairy tale city where the academies where the academies were wretches who had trampled on the sacred opportunity of an earthly existence or to make themselves capable of decisive indispensable reform mm -hmm. so that later after a new reincarnation incarnation in which they proved the qualities they had acquired they would be admitted into true initiation I will not try to describe the enchantment that radiated from that borough where the domes and spires of the buildings looked like subtly scintillating filigrees, as if covered with dew, and upon which the sun's rays, in combination with the vapors of sublimated gases, lent them tonalities whose beauty I have nothing to compare to. He couldn't even describe in our words what he was seeing and we are talking about a place that is dedicated to helping suicidal spirits imagine in colonies that are much higher up and you may be asking Vanessa why do I care about this why because we're not going to progress if we don't visualize the good and this is the good when the spirits reveal to us these beauties or the beauty of the spiritual realm, the harmony, they are teaching us to want to be in an environment that is beautiful, that is harmonious, so we can co-create in harmony. So these are not details to be put aside. There is a heavy moral aspect to it because it's inviting us to harmony, harmony, beauty equals harmony, harmony equals to beauty, according to Leon Denis in his book, Spiritism in the Arts, and it makes so much sense. Everything was designed with a stately superiority that suggested a grandeur unconceivable to incarnate human beings. You see why we are highlighting this? Everything was designed by architects that were above the level of humanity, meaning angelic. He is describing angelic, angelically designed hospitals, university in the spiritual realm okay but it this was not a privileged residence in fact it was just one step above our sad hospital home but he had a lot of gratitude and they were moved he said they had inscriptions of the kinds of classes they would be taking which kind of classes morality philosophy science, psychology, pedagogy, cosmogony, and even a new language, Esperanto. Mm -hmm. Talking about the one language, one, ba one banner, one shepherd. They talk about how important it is to break down the barriers of misunderstandings amongst people. So they talk about Esperanto as the language that will potentially in the very future unite all the people, but it's going to take a while. Meanwhile, English is the language, so let's stick to it for now. It's more practical. So just like our borough, it was called hope. Everything Esperanto means esperanza, meaning hope. So everything is about hope, 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 hope. Hope. hope is the center stage for us 
in the regeneration of all of us. We had arrived the day before when the stars were starting to shine with their luminous radiance. Romeo and Alceste introduced us to the directors of the new district and then bid us farewell. Their mission with us had come to an end. We were overcome with profound emotion. We embraced them as they said to us with a smile, we're not really going to be separated. You have only changed locations within the same home. In fact, isn't the whole infinite universe the home of God's creatures? And then who was the director that was going to take over? Brother Sosthenes in Hope City. Okay. So he says, welcome, my dear sons. May Jesus be the only true master here, inspiring your conduct in the new phase, the phase that is beginning for you today. Be trustful, learn, work, so that you can emerge triumphant. This city is your city, and you believe in a home that is your home, where you meet other brothers and sisters like yourselves all children of the Eternal One. Mary, with the consent of her August Son, ordered its creation to give you the opportunity to prepare yourselves honorably for your rehabilitation. You will find in her maternal love the sublime support you need to conquer the darkness of the wrongdoings that have distanced you from the footsteps of the great Master to whom you owe love and obedience above all. Therefore, you must hasten your progress to make up for lost time. I hope you'll be able to intelligently comprehend what it is that you need. We couldn't respond. Tears filled our eyes. We're like bashful little boys standing for the first time in front of an aged and revered professor that was still not well understood. <coughs> so... It's interesting for us to observe the mercy of On High creating a university to instruct those who were considered criminals before God, but needed an opportunity to be instructed in order to evolve more steadily. Let's go to the book Thought in Life by Emilio. In chapter 4, he titles it instruction and says that it's our responsibility to instruct ourselves. We need really to acquire new instruction in order to progress. So for you and I, it's inevitable that we dedicate our side, uh, ourselves to studying and to getting to know more knowledge. Right, Vida de Cássia? Welcome to Kardec Radio. So, friends, this is mind-blowing for us. Because you go on earth, if you go to prisons, for example, we are evolving, but we are yet to give people who are criminals the true rehabilitation pathway. But this book inspires us to change it, to improve it. But you know, we need a lot of psychological understanding as well. No wonder they're going to have classes in psychology as well to understand themselves and life. He then starts to describe the trees, the groups of students that were learning in nature, just like at Socrates and Plato's time, women who were walking down the aisles accompanied by guardians, and they were so absorbed in the scenery, letting their imagination, you know, take flight, that at one point, two women approached them, and these two women would be their their conductors throughout the pathway for some time, describing who they were, okay? First of them is Rita de Cássia de Forjas Frazão. 
Yes. She was dressed up in a particular way, a white tunic cinched at the waist, a blue robe worn in the ancient Greek style, and a small garland of tiny roses decorating on her ivory brow. She looked like an angel, lacking only the wings. And then he asked himself, Camilo, like, why is she dressed up like this? And she says, you know, I was buried like this <laughs> when I last incarnated. And I just decided to stay in this way, in the spiritual realm. That was her choice. The second woman was tall, blonde, around 50 years of age, more or less. And she was kind and attractive. And she said her name was Doris Mary Steele da Costa. And she said that she was the mother of Joel, the Joel that we saw in previous chapters, who was a suicidal spirit who reformed himself, became a worker in the hospital, and Doris is his mother. They were charmed. The group by Camilo consisted of 200 wrongdoers and was one of the largest in the sector at the time. There were people from different social classes and many women who were coming from Brazil because the number of suicides amongst women in Brazil were higher than in Portugal, the book is saying back then. Nowadays, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, Brother Sosthenes began by asking everybody to pray to God. Then he started calling for people's names, like the roll call started. They were saying the names, people were saying, I'm here, I'm here, and then he said, at this moment, you're starting a new phase in your existence as delinquent spirits, my dear friends. Of all the patients that arrived with you at this colony, you are the only ones capable of enduring the struggles of the spiritual learning experience that will provide you with a solid foundation for acquiring personal merits in the days ahead. You are being admitted into our schools because you have demonstrated the moral and mental growth necessary for acquiring knowledge that will enable you to undertake a rehabilitating reincarnation capable of furnishing you with the things you need in order to recover from the wrong to which you succumbed. As you must have been aware of for some time now, you are not the irredeemable condemned to whom the universal law would apply extreme measures, relegating you forever to your present unevolved condition, abandoning you to your inconsolable anguishes. On the contrary, we are here to tell you that you have the right to expect much. Write it down. I think this is so important for us. We are here to tell you that you have the right to expect much from the paternal goodness of the omnipotent creator since the law he established is giving all of you the chance to begin anew the lifetimes you cut short via suicide and thus an opportunity for sure rehabilitation. Did we hear that? Okay, highlight. You have the right to expect much from the paternal goodness of the Creator. Pause, feeling the scripture. Do you expect much from God's goodness? Do you feel God 
as your loving parent? Or is God so far, so distant that you doubt that you deserve God's goodness? God created you. He invented you and me. We, we can't help it but to consult and gravitate to God all the time, saying, excuse me, you created me. Can, can we understand what this is for? You're so good, but tell me, what do I do with this? You need to guide me. Inspire me, because I don't know what else. Think about it. He created you. You can't help it but to go to God all the time and say, excuse me, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. What is this for? What is that for? You understand how important this is? We, he says, we have the right to expect much from God's goodness. But so many people don't because they feel like, oh, but I, I made so many mistakes. But God created you with the possibility of choosing this or that. So you can go back and say, look, I chose this and it was wrong. Now, please help me fix it up because only you can help me. I don't know what else I'm going to do if you don't help me. It changes our perspective. Thank you, Adilson, for copying and pasting here on Facebook this very paragraph that we're talking about. It is on us to refer to God all the time and say, I have to ask for your help because you created me. Do you see why Jesus, though, at his perfect level, he was always referring to God, referring to God, referring to God, and talking with God? Why? Because he understands that we are not self-made, that God created us. He's the only one that understands us fully, the only one that knows the reasons why he created us there are divine purposes for us to exist it's beyond just self-improvement our purpose the purpose of our existence is beyond just our own betterment or our blossoming in divine potentialities it has to do with the whole universe you are important you matter we matter. And you see how these suicidal spirits are treated without humiliation, distinction. And sometimes I see that even though people are religious, spiritists, they still play the prejudices of life, treating people differently due to their inner judgment yes i'll treat you with loving kindness because you're ex but you i'm not so sure i've heard this about you so you i'm not so sure i'm gonna treat you the same way or give you the same rights thank god before god we're just alike god doesn't make distinction between jesus and us god loves us the same because god is immutable he doesn't change because we expand our potentialities. The universe is always expanding, and yet God is immutable. His laws are the same, have been the same. They don't change. He's immaterial. He's just in good. Do you believe in his goodness? So in the next 24 hours, this will be our exercise 
to expect much from God's goodness. Shall we? That's our exercise in the next 24 hours. Let us expect much from God's goodness. Be not because we deserve, but because we have to. Because without God, who are we? Saying, God, I need you. I need your care, your providence, your embrace, your protection. Please help me. This is humility. When we say, like little kids, I can do it by myself. We are immature. Jesus didn't play that. Because when we grow mature, we understand we'll always be dependent on God. Always. We have to do our share. But we'll always depend on God. Okay? So Brother Sosthenes is saying to us, Because you know nothing about spiritual life, it is urgent that you be enlightened about it. Till now, your stay in the spirit world has been lived in the lower zones, where you have learned very little, morally speaking, due to the armor of animality that envelops your mental vibration strongly tied to the realm of sensations. But after nearly one century, the time has come to apply stricter discipline to your continued follies, to awaken you from the vicious circle in which you have been stuck and to lead you to the dawn of redemption in Jesus, which will take you to the true goal that you must reach as God's creatures. You must start a course of moral, mental, spiritual re-education, for that is what you're lacking. Your predisposition to such a lofty endeavor is the answer to your desperate pleas to be delivered from your suffering. A course of moral, mental, spiritual re-education. Moral, mental, spiritual re-education. Okay, And I must warn you, my friends, in the struggles you will undertake to achieve such a task, more than one century will see the tears you shed because of your execrable act of irreverence towards yourselves and towards God. As we said before, when we commit suicide, unfortunately, it takes a century, two or three or more, to start putting things in place. It's hard. That's why patience is so important. Instruction is vital, okay? You're right, Silvio Otero. God is the air that we breathe, right? Yes, yes. So, for us, we're going to see now that God is so good that he is going to give three main structures for this group that Camilo is in. And you see that these instructors are of the highest order. And I say highest because it's not like ordinary. The credentials of the masters to whom you're being trusted for this moment on in the name of the Heavenly Shepherd, go back in virtue and merit to a very remote past, many times tasked by means of sanctified trials. So who is the instructor number one? Epaminondas de Vigo, who in a brilliant ancient ascent from ancient Egypt to the somber days of the Middle Ages in Spain, always served the truth and praised the name of God. His triumph has not diminished one bit in the spiritual realms. In apostolic times, when as a disciple of Simon Peter, he glorified the divine master. 
he had the supreme honor of being martyred in the circus of Domitius Neros. Nero, in Spain under the Empire of Darkness, he was killed by the Inquisition as well. Okay, this is just one of them. The other one, Soria Omar, an ancient master of initiation in Alexandria, and then a philosopher in Greece, right after the coming of Socrates, then undying torchlights began to lead for the people until then deprived of the sublime knowledge. He, like the eminent precursor of the great master, Socrates, he taught the secret doctrine to the disciples, to the misfortune, etc. So you're going to see that he also reincarnated in Judea and was attracted by the figure of Master Jesus, practicing benevolent, humble acts as he follows the luminous steps of the Heavenly Shepherd. In only age, he witnessed the persecutions in Jerusalem right after the stoning of Stephen. So, you see that both Suryomar and Epaminondas, they were bringing all these teachings, they were suffering persecutions, and then finally, Anibal. Anibal, this young man, knew Jesus of Nazareth, during his unforgettable ministry in awful Judea. Anibal, son of Silas, was one of the children welcomed by Jesus when demonstrating his unmistakable tenderness once more amid the vacillating flowers, he said, Let the children come to me because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Anibal will instruct you about Christian teachings in the exact same way he learned them from Jesus, whom he had loved fervently ever since his remote, remote childhood in the East. He says that when the Lord preached his gentle doctrine of love, marvelously precise, elucidating images appeared unexpectedly before the eyes of the listeners of goodwill, enlightening them in an unmistakable manner and imprinting never to be forgotten illustrations on the folds of their being. That is why the great envoy preaching in unshakable serenity could hold the attention of the famished multitudes for hours on end, control turbulent mobs, enrapture listeners and convince hearts that would either prostrate themselves fearful and dazed when he passed by or adhere faithful and enchanted to his doctrine. The impious, however, those whose rebellious minds were in disaccord with the divine vibrations perceived nothing. They only heard things whose loftiness they were unable to grasp because their souls were replete with the deadly virus of ill will. Open a parenthesis here. Why? Parenthesis. He's saying that Anibal, when he was a child, he was there in the arms of Jesus. He learned from Jesus since he was a child. And he describes that when Jesus spoke, he formed like scenes magnetically enveloping everybody and sustaining their souls even though they were sick, they were turbulent, they were hungry, they were thirsty. But you think everybody could see what Jesus was projecting? No. There are two words here that he repeated. Goodwill, it will. And he said that those who had goodwill were capable of perceiving it, what Jesus was transmitting. Those who had ill will couldn't see it. And that was Jesus. What are the lessons here? First, before being afraid about the coronavirus, we should be afraid about the deadly virus named ill will. 
That's a virus we need to be afraid of inside of us when we don't have goodwill. Because when we have goodwill, we connect to the good. Go to the book, Our Daily Bread by Emmanuel, and its messages. And I can assure you, I have it here. I will confirm to tell you about this. And these messages are, if I'm not mistaken, 66, 67. But let me double check so you have a reference for your study later on. It's right here. Yeah, 66, goodwill, 67, ill will. Goodwill will find works to be done. And then at the end of it all, ill will leads to darkness. So it shows to us that those who could not connect to the heart of Jesus, they had this deadly virus of ill will. Why? Because of selfishness, because of pride. We don't want to change. We don't want to be transformed. We don't seek the good. We are ill will. And these are the cases, this is the, is the case of the many people who see the good and they are capable of painting the darkest colors in the most beautiful things. They see people doing the good and they are capable of creating slander against people who are doing the good. They did it with Jesus. They did it with Chico Xavier, and they will do with you and me and everybody if we try to do the good. Because those who have ill will, they can't see the good. Hopefully, we're not those. If people are doing the good, bless their hearts. But there's no but. If they are doing the good, period, God bless them. God bless them. Right? Hannibal grew up and became a man, always feeling enveloped by the Divine Shepherd's undying radiations, which were never erased from in his memories. And he really worked hard for it. He traveled, suffered persecution, insult, affronts, and injustice at a time when it was socially acceptable to criticize, offend, persecute, and kill the followers of the Nazarene. And when he finally arrived in Rome, he was glorified with martyrdom for his love for the heavenly envoy. When at 37 years of age, his physical body was incinerated on one of those poles used to illuminate festivities in the infamous gardens of Nero. So Anibal, the truth is that Anibal had been prepared for this since remotest times. There is more story about Anibal and you can read in this book. But for us, what is sure, sure and certain is that these teachers will lead us to the true understanding of what we need to understand in the upcoming chapters. But let me read one more thing. And then one day, in praise for Anibal's spirit, as a faithful and loving servant. A direct order came down from the higher spheres of light as a gift for so many centuries of devotion and love, saying, Jesus telling him, go Anibal and devote your work to my mother's legion. Use my teachings, which you love so much, to help them, these most in need of light and strength. Concentrate preferably 
whom those whose minds have succumbed under the punishment of having committed suicide. For a long time now, I have commended them to my mother, for only maternal inspiration is sufficiently charitable to uplift them towards God. Teach them my words, awaken them, remind them of the examples I left behind, use my teachings to instruct them to love, to serve, to dominate their passions by overcoming them with the power of knowledge, to find the pathways I traced out for redemption in the fulfillment of duty, and to suffer patiently, because suffering is the prelude to glory, the powerful lever of progress. Open to them the book of your memories. Remember when you heard me preach in Judea, and illuminate them with the light of my gospel, because that is all that they lack. And here he is, my dear children, modest, looking young as an adolescent, but touched by immortal flame of inspiration that links him to the limitless goodness of the sublime master. I entrust you to him. Intense emotion came over our souls, says Camillo, with the deepest sentiments of admiration for those three figures who had been introduced to us and who would so closely be linked to our destinies for an amount of time we would not yet foretell. Also, the figure of the Nazarene had been singularly presented to us. Until then, he had seemed to us more like a sublime ideal, incomprehensible to human minds, than a real person capable of being understood and emulated by ordinary men and women. Our three masters, however, had lived when he had lived. They had known him. They had heard him speak. They had even talked to him, for the divine master never refused to talk, to speak to anyone who sought him. One of the three had even felt the gentle caress of his hand on his head. This Jesus Christ, thus known, thus seen, thus loved, grabbed our full attention. Sostenes, the instructor continued. As it is never advised to waste time, since time wasted is the blessed endeavor of progress. Since time wasted in the blessed endeavor of progress can result in problems that are very hard to repair in the future, we will start to implement measures for your benefit this very day. You once more be divided into homogeneous groups of 10, and as was the rule at the hospital, men and women will be separated only during classes or in certain days scheduled for recreation or admitted, will be able to mingle and exchange ideas. This is because you still bear painful vestiges of physical matter, troubling mental tendencies that you must educate. Your thoughts must become accustomed to a wholesome discipline they must be turned as quickly as possible towards the good expressions of the spirits. And you practice mental exercise of uplifting your soul towards the infinite. Now, I will highlight this so we wrap up. The idea of sex is one of the most troublesome obstacles to mental conquests. Write it down. Sexual tendencies oppress the will, disturb the energies of the soul, dulling its faculties and drawing it towards heavy, inferior vibrations that delay the true state of spirituality. Therefore, while you are not yet sufficiently advanced, such isolation is only prudent. It's a wise counselor that will enable you to forget that you were men and women in a not-too-distant past. Okay. Sexual tendencies oppress the will, disturb the energies of the soul. An invitation for us. 
to sublimate. How do we do it? Pray. Let us pray. Asking God, remember, we need to expect much from God's goodness. Saying, God, you created it. What do I do with it? We're talking about sex. You didn't create that. God did. What for? We need to learn. Allow God to teach us. Pray, asking for illumination, for education of the sexual forces. Shall we? We can ask for that. And you think we'll go unanswered? No. No, no, no. And as you have seen here, Jesus asked his mother to take care of the suicides because only the maternal inspiration can help these hearts that are suffering. You see, are we alone, friends? Are you feeling what I'm feeling? How much we are loved? How much we are cared for? Is there hope? Of course there is. Because we are never, ever, ever alone. And God is so good that God assigned wonderful spirits to care for us. As if we have babysitters. Friends, let us pray. In gratitude to these beautiful works of Jesus to Mother Mary's legion, and let us help out, shall we? Of the many lessons we have embraced today, now it's our turn to join forces and pray. So I'm going to invite you now, don't go away. Don't go away, because we need to pray. It even rhymes, huh? Don't go away, because we have to pray. And prayer here is service now. It's not only for ourselves. It's for those who need the most. The suicidal brothers and sisters. Shall we, friends? The Ave Maria. Let us visualize Mother Mary and her legion of servants, her loving smile, her kind embrace, enveloping us in new balancing energies. Dear Mother Mary, we would like to contribute with our wishes of wellness and recovery towards all suicidal spirits that are cared for by you. We pray, visualizing your blanket of sky blue healing light enveloping each one of them, bringing them warmth and relief as your team kindly rescue the ones that are ready for the next step. May the showers of your healing love envelop everyone in new hope. And we also pray for those incarnates who are desperate 
and are so desperate they cannot see a solution to their problems. May they feel your loving embrace and be enveloped by your healing light, your blanket of healing light, as they hear your words in their ears saying, My dear child, this shall pass. My dear child, this shall pass. My dear child, this shall pass. And they feel the envelopment of the loving and kind protecting spirits, soothing their souls, calming their desperation, and bringing new solutions. Dear God of life, we expect much from your goodness, for you've created us, and we want to devote our lives to you. Thank you for bringing new purpose to us, a new meaning every day, and we can only imagine Watch the, what the future awaits, as there is always more for us to expand, to learn, to serve, and to love. Thank you for bringing Jesus to our lives. Thank you for bringing Mother Mary. And for Yvonne Pereira, Camilo Botelho, Leon Denis, for their task force bringing this book to us that is truly a book of hope. May we stay under your loving care, attentive to your instructions and guidance, and so be it. Na 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 Thank you friends for being here with us at Cardiac Radio once again. God willing we'll be back tomorrow with another lifting hope here at Cardiac Radio, always nourishing our souls. A big hug to you and until tomorrow, God willing.